Foster Cave and I'm Powered Trini. Strength for the powerless. Courage for the fearful. Hope and healing for wounded hearts. Hello and welcome back to Foster Care, an unparalleled journey with Jason and Amanda. And this week we're talking with Anthony Trucks. Anthony Trucks is a former NFL football player who has a deep story. I ran across Anthony in a uh, in an interview I heard him do with Larry Hagner a while back from the Dad Edge podcast, and I went, "Wow, this guy's story is exactly in line with what we're talking about." So. Anthony is an awesome dude, and I want to welcome him here to talk with you guys today. How are you doing, Anthony? I'm doing well, man. How are you doing? Oh, man, we're doing good. We took the kids fishing this morning, and okay. and, and you know what that means when you're a dad who gets to go fishing. That means I've been changing hooks all morning. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I don't eat fish. So I haven't gone fishing often, but I very, very vividly remember fishing and that being part of the process all the time. Well, I was listening to to Larry talk with you here a while back, and in the middle of the story, I heard you just casually mention that that you had an experience in foster care, and you kind of briefly touched on it. But man, it sounds like you had a heck of a story there. Oh, yeah, yeah. It it depends on uh, kind of what parts of my life people want to unpack. I have a lot of weird aspects in in, uh, this link that happened fairly, you know, often after foster care, but foster care is a humongous part of my life experience and who I am. I spent 11 years in the system. Wow, 11 years. Yeah. How old were you when you came into the system? Uh, three years old. Yeah, I wasn't adopted until I was 14. Wow. So so what brought you into the system originally? Uh, my biological mom, she uh, she had me and then every year after and then you know, sometimes sooner she had three more kids. So they had the same dad, guy named Eddie, and then she had me. And, uh, and I didn't know my dad's real name. My mom is actually white. And my dad on the birth certificate says his name is Daniel Patrick O'Byrne, which is also Irish and white. So... As a black man, something was off, so I never knew his name. Uh, and yeah, so she, when I was, you know, about three years old, she gave us all away. As far as the, the documents say, like, she just pretty much called. I was like, I can't handle these kids. And then and we were now in the system. Holy cow. Yeah. Did you ever reconnect with your mom? You know, it's interesting. Throughout the years, she's always been uh, a present entity, we'll call it. She she had these things called parental rights, which, you know, parents have. And so with those, she abused them. So she found some loopholes where she could change my ethnicity and change some things so she could ward off me being adopted by different families who might have wanted to predominantly, like predominantly just one family when I was six from six to 14 same eight years of the family but she was around supposedly doing visitations supposed to show up to different places and then you know meet with us but what happened is we'd have the visitations all four would show up their dad would be there my three siblings but my mom would never show up so I'd sit there for hours every time these things took place and watch you know those kids play with their parent and me just sit there by myself kind of sad and whenever I would go home, of the years I can recall consciously, uh, she would always call and make some crazy excuses of why she didn't make it. She at one point, you know, owned Apple and was a Mensa member and was an astronaut. I mean, these crazy off the wall excuses as to why she couldn't make it. And as a kid, you know, when you're in the foster care system, even though you, you, you know, your mom's the best you know person for you to be with, like, that's all you want. So you eat it up and you just, they just play with the emotions of the child. So for me, for a lot of years, up until like 13, 14, I could make a choice. She just consistently would make up lies. So she was present the entire time, but miss visitations, do us all the time. And in fact, every time she would call after, I don't know what it was, but every time that it would have like a miss visit and she'd call and talk, she'd tell me to wait by the window and I'm going to pick you up at eight o'clock, just pack a bag. And so you might know, secretly pack a bag and sit there and just watch cars pass for hours and cry myself to sleep. And then uh, I would end up every night wet in the bed. Up until like 14 years old, I would wet the bed every time that happened. And uh, and after a while, it stopped, you know, this, the the aspect of like, I'm going to pick you up, stop. But just the calls would be triggering enough. It's so like my my foster family, my foster mom at the time, before she adopted me, you know, by 12, 13, we knew. And she'd call and I'd talk to her. It was like this thing, like, here we go. And then, yeah, sure enough, no matter what we tried, don't drink water, don't do it. Whatever it was, I still would wet the bed. So. Yeah, man, she was present. And I don't think she was the best best presence in my life at the time, but she was there. And I don't necessarily even understand this part. So, and maybe you have have some understanding about it, but there is something about biological mom that runs so deep in a child's mind. Yeah, surpasses the anything that makes sense. Well, society points it out to us in every you know video you know that you see in a Disney movie or every you know you know TV show and what you see around town and Mom's Day and Father's Day. 
it's always there. It's so woven in that you're consistently being bombarded with the fact that you don't have that. So I think it's why it runs so deep. It's this desire that you can't fulfill. And then that's what it just becomes this lingering thing that just trails with us sometimes for our entire life. Yeah. Now, did you ever have any connection with your biological father? You know, at 21 years old, so I, I ended up getting a scholarship to play football at the University of Oregon. Getting there was a long journey. I beat a lot of statistics in doing that. And uh, when I was 20, I want to say 20 years old, I had my first son in college as a college athlete with my high school sweetheart. And somehow my mom had like, I want to say at 16 years old, we'd lost touch. Like 14, I talked to her and like 16, uh, something like she had a call or something. Anyways, at one point before going to college on a scholarship, she'd called me and told me that she uh, lived in Jacksonville, Florida, needed a kidney and I, and I needed to give her a kidney or she'd die in six months. And this would have obviously stopped my football career. So now I'm in this age of like, it's like, you know, a gap of a couple of years and I'm revisited with this weird anxiety and situation. So I was like, no, that happened eventually. But at 20 years old, I had my son and she and my grandmother somehow moved two hours north of where I went to college at Oregon. It's a place called Mount St. Helens. And I have no idea how they got my phone number. It was the weirdest thing, but I got a call while in college. Like, hey, I heard you had a kid and we, you know, we'd love to come see him. And I was like, that's not happening. Unless you tell me exactly, because for years she told me the reason why I was in foster care is because the state had paid her ten thousand dollars or paid her boyfriend ten thousand dollars to beat her up to take the kids. Some weird convoluted stories. And so I was like, here's the thing: I'm I'm a grown up kind of now. I got a kid. Like, if you tell me the truth, you can come down. If you don't, then you can't come visit. And so never told me the truth, and it kind of split ties. But then in that connection, I met my grandmother, my real grandma. So my real grandma uh, finally gave my dad's last name, and my Beyonce at the time, mother of my child, now my wife, uh, she kept prodding me to ask, you know, for my dad's name. My grandma, grandma refused for a couple of times. She eventually said, all right, his name's Anthony Asaibobo. So we went looking online at the time. It's like 2000 and man, I want to say it's probably 2003, 2002, 2003. And we went looking and, uh, and found that the, there's like three names in the United States with the last name Asaibobo. One of them happened to be Anthony. So looked the number up, lived in Maria, Georgia gave him a call and kind of gave him a brief aspect of the story. And he's like, yep, yeah, I'm your dad. And at the time he had no idea I existed. He's, you know, he's apologized for not being present. And, and so it was, it was interesting. I had to meet my dad in my very first collegiate start on national television, got the game ball. So it's kind of cool. Fast forward nine years uh, before he passed away of cancer, he actually admitted that he had known about me the entire time I was alive and just didn't know how to, to come back. So some interesting dynamics there, but I did meet him eventually. No ill will towards him, but yeah, I do know who he is. I got to ask because, you know, being in the dad's group that, that I'm in, one of the things that we talk about a lot is that father wound. So many guys end up damaged by, by something with their dad and, yeah. you know, full, you know, full transparency here. I'm me and my dad had, had a great relationship. He passed away a few years ago from cancer as well, but, but we had, I had a great dad. I had a great relationship with my father, but you know, that father wound tends to run deep in a lot of guys. It can, yeah. Yeah, their dad wasn't there. If he wasn't available, if he, you know, th those things don't just go away. So how did you, how did you find your way through that, man, without, without having that anybody to lead you through that, or did you have somebody to help you walk through? That? Yeah, well, I had you know, I had my foster dad, who my is my adoptive dad, my dad, I guess the best way to point of frame is my dad. Now, interesting thing, he's only twelve years older than me. Right, he is. Uh, my mom, my adoptive mom, is only seventeen years older than me. She actually had my older brother when she was fourteen. And my grandma had my mom when she was 15, which made her 29-year-old grandma. So a lot of weird dynamics. But I had my dad, but he was, he was you know, I, I want to say love to death. He wasn't very emotionally involved. In those days, it's kind of still not his thing. He's hardworking, blue-collar guy. He's a welder. Love him. But there's just, you know, certain things that I, I feel like um, weren't, you know, taught to me, we'll call it. But not even by his own fault. And I think this is kind of where I got the grasp of why I'm not so angry at my own biological father. And, and the realization came, I think, years after, but I started realizing, like, my own mom, you know, my dad, like, unfortunately, people in life are not always given the tools to to build the house. They try, but they make a rickety house that falls down. So what I realized is, like, they're not always doing things that are trying to actively hurt me. Like, he didn't want to see me do bad and, and be a foster. He didn't try to disappear from my life. For some reason, in his eyes, the best thing for me was for him not to be there. And he was trying to do the best he could, and it sucked. So a lot of people aren't doing things maliciously, but the byproduct and the offset, you know, experience for me sucks. So I don't have this ill will towards him because the weirdest thing is he was actually doing kind of the best that he thought he could at the moment because he actually found out I was born out of wedlock. I have an older sister and a younger brother or a different woman, right? In a whole different area. So I was kind of bored 
out of wedlock, he kind of figured like if it was if I was in the in between, it'd be tough. So just let the guy be with his mom and she'll take care of him. He just kind of cut ties and left. Didn't realize what was going on the whole time, right? So it's the kind of thing where it's like it sucks. Like it, it wasn't something he tried to do. It was, you know, kind of something that obviously had an impact on my life, but am I gonna be angry at him forever? And then I'm a bad dad and it just trickles over. So I just kind of chose to uh to stop the the path of what our trajectory of uh, the parenting situations in my life were. Well, I have to ask because, you know, we, we deal with, you know, all of our kids have obvious some obviously have some disconnection with their biological parents because I know there's a lot of open adoptions out there and open adoption is great when that's an option. But mm-hmm. unfortunately for a number of our kids, um, three of the four, their, their biological father is gone now. And in the mom is, mm-hmm. is in a, a prop, a problem with an addiction issue. Gotcha. So I, I know that, that they will, they will, if they're not already, you know, depending on which age ki- kid we're talking about here, but they're dealing with that already. It's understanding that. How did you, how did you find your way to not being angry with your dad and finding a way, I guess, I guess a way to, to resolve that, that piece in your life where you, you expected a dad to be there and you, you wanted that. I mean, honestly, it had to have probably helped. I would assume to have your, your adoptive dad there. Yeah, it definitely helped. Biological is something that for whatever reason is hardwired in us. It is. I mean, the, the snatch is, it's kind of the, the knowing, like knowing where you are, who somebody is. And it's a very interesting thing, but I agree with that. I don't think it, it became something that made actual sense to me until probably in my, my late twenties, early thirties. Like it was, it was something that for a lot of years, it's definitely this, this hole. It's a, this like area where you just don't really know how to fill it. And again, the world presents you the fact that you're missing this thing all the time. So I, I don't know, man, I think the thing for me to not get to a point of pain was to, uh, to kind of take a look, like you said, the person who was present, my dad, like I, my, my foster dad, when I played college football, he would work like till he'd get up at four in the morning, go to work, get off of work like five or six, sometimes later, he would come home, right? But when I had games, he would go to work at 4 a.m. He'd get off at like, you know, six, eight o'clock, whatever. And then he would actually hit the road and then drive straight to Oregon, get there right in time, sometimes for kickoff, because he'd get up early and he'd get there for kickoff and he'd watch the game and fall asleep after for like hours. So like he was a guy who was present and he was there. He took care of my mom who had MS at the time. And, uh, and man, so like he did show, he did show up. He was there. I didn't have this complete missing gaping hole. So a presence of a father figure most definitely was a positive thing for me. Well, yeah. Uh, and I, I know that story a little bit too well. I get up and go to work at four o'clock in the morning myself and don't get off until five or six o'clock in the evening oftentimes. So yeah, mm-hmm. that's him. Yeah. Yeah, I know that that experience well, but it's one of the things I just know that a lot of kids out there go through that loss of, of their first family. And mm-hmm. it's so difficult for kids. And it seems like you've come to a healthy place in your own mind. I don't think, well, I know for a fact that, that a lot of people don't. I, I'm in a few groups online and I, I watch some of the, the former foster youth sort of thing or former adoptees uh, groups and see what they have to say. And so many people end up so angry of, over it because yes. it was it was a bad situation now now through your years i know you said you were you were in foster care for 11 years did you have primarily good homes did you have good experience bad uh, experience i had five bad one good and one was got it was got good it's the one i'm in now it got good i guess the best way to explain it but the first five man there might have been one that was okay but I, I remember all of them vividly i remember the very first house the layout of the house it's weird it's like it's seared into my brain uh, I remember my first house that like I, I was taken from, it's just the dynamics were just there, but I had a lot of people do some heinous things, man, beat me, starve me, torch me, weird stuff. And, and even those people, like I don't have an ill will towards, I think the, at a certain point, the anger kind of became this thing that, uh, that I had this feeling of helplessness. And I think it's sometimes where a lot of the pain comes from is this feeling of helplessness. I have no control over it, which creates this anger because of lack of control. Like as a father, when my kids don't do what I ask, I freak out. Like, what do you, I just told you to clean your room. Why don't you know? So you get angry because you have no control. And I think with situations like those, I feel like I had no control. And when I got to a point of realizing like the, the place I do in fact have a control is my, my true emotional response and what I create from this, it became more of a freeing place where I had uh, less of the anxiety, less of the anger because I was now creating something better for my life. So I took control of what I could create from that. And that's given me such a bigger peace because I think if you have nothing that makes you you, nothing you've built in that gives you that sense of of strength of self and personal development, like of, of like this is the person I am because I am the speaker, the author, the coach, the dad, the brother, whatever it is. Then all I'm all I'm left with is what I what I have, which is this situation I had no control over. And that's what anchors my my emotions. 
So, yeah, man, I think for me and, and what I talk to a lot of people about and what it gives me peace is like, we got to find something that you can build and create in opposition of everything that was done to you to where you can anchor your, your sense of identity on that, not the identity of something's missing. So do you feel like, I guess your, uh, your opposition to that, you're f- kind of proving people wrong, fighting against what, what people would, uh, would perceive as what was done to you so that you can say, look at me, I'm going to become something better. Kind of, kind of that. Um, I, I had a friend of mine who was mm-hmm. very much that way. If, if you wanted him to do something, all you had to do yeah. was tell him he couldn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's not to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's not so much me. If I, if I told him he couldn't clean the house in, in five minutes flat, he'd come clean my house. It would be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I think I started that way. And the problem I had with that was once I started proving people wrong, then I had the, the lack of driving force. And so I started getting to a point where I, I was more so doing things to uphold and build the, the sense of self of who I was, as opposed to do it to prove somebody wrong. Because when driving force is an external situation, then that can always change. And so if it's internal, if it's me, it's like, I'm doing this for me. So essentially, like I do what I do to not let yesterday's Anthony down. It's the best way I can put it into simple words. And yesterday's Anthony did a lot of work. He created some good stuff. He did whatever he did, right? Could have been two years ago, Anthony. But today's Anthony is like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep stepping on the shoulders of that guy. And so I don't have to have this drive that's, that's external based on, you know, what somebody said or, you know, where they may see me. Because then once you do it, then, then what? All right, I did it. Now you're wrong. Well, now what? You know? And then it's this thing that's consistently a back and forth. And unfortunately, the world has a really crappy scale of what's good enough because it's unset. And no one knows what it is. It's just weird, fickle things. So even if I do achieve something great, somebody out there is going to make me feel bad for it. So why would I want to set myself up for that kind of weird feeling? Just have my own choice of what internally is great and shoot for that. Then if somebody does show up, I could be like, cool, glad to feel that way. But here's my scale. And I feel really good about what I did. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. It's a question I've asked a lot of people when they, they talk about that feeling of not being good enough. And my Mm -hmm. question is always, well, what is good enough? Whatever you want it to be. I haven't met anyone yet who has the answer to that question. Yes, I mean, my answer is whatever whatever I want to be good enough. Are you ready to turn it off? Just walk away? Never listen again? I hope not. I really hope not. Anthony was a great dude, has a lot more wisdom to drop. So stay tuned for the rest of it. And if you want to catch next week's episode... Be sure and hit subscribe on your podcast player there and you'll get notified next Tuesday morning when one of them shows up and you can be one of the first ones to listen to it. If you want to be a little earlier than that, go to our Facebook page at Foster Care and Unparalleled Journey. Jump in over there and we usually post a link a day or so early on our website. You can get it there and listen over there at fostercarenation.com. We really appreciate all the support you guys have given us. If you'd like to support us financially, go on over to patreon.com slash fostercarenation A buck or two a month is awesome. We appreciate everybody who's supporting us in one way or another. If you don't have any money to spend, that's cool, man. Just tell somebody about the podcast. Let them know about the stories and send them our way. It'd be great to be able to reach more people. So until next Tuesday morning, we will see you then. Now back to Anthony. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. It's a question I've asked a lot of people when they they talk about that feeling of not being good enough and my Mm -hmm. question is always well what is good enough whatever you want it to be i haven't met anyone yet who has the answer to that question yes i mean my answer is whatever whatever i want to be good enough because we have our own so i I do this with two people one's with you one's an external source so one thing is we'll always set goals we think are realistic things that we see in ourselves the problem is, is we typically hold this power called pinky finger power I did American Ninja Warrior, and I learned that the the most insignificant part of your hand is the strongest, the pinky ear. So a lot of people have this insignificant strength. They don't even realize it's an amazing strength, and they just kind of do a thing and forget about it. So I I like to have people set goals by themselves. What do you think you can do? And then find somebody who you know loves you and sees you in a little different light and have them kind of stretch that goal a little bit, a little bit uncomfortable. And then what you find is you start getting this, this interesting window of perspective of what's possible, like more than what you may think or may see. And that becomes what's good enough. It doesn't have to be a billion dollars to be good enough. So when you determine what this is, a little bit outside the comfort zone, shoot for that. And when you achieve that, maybe you redo the process. Maybe you don't. Maybe it's like, I just want to have a good family, be a good dad, have a good job. Like, that's great. And if you can settle and be comfortable with that, you'd find the things that everybody else is looking for, even those who want money and want the yachts and the cars. Everyone's looking to be settled inside. 
really what it boils down to. It's like people just want to have peace and be settled. And, and you can be, you can be around people and find the ones who you know just are unsettled inside. They, they can't shut up a million stories or something going on. Like, and they can't be in a space with you and just be quiet. Like I, if I can sit with somebody in a room and just be quiet, like I like that. I'm, I'm settled. Like you're settled. We can have a conversation. I know you can control your emotions. You're not going to be capricious and go up and down. And like those kind of people, they're warm. I like being around them, but that's good enough. That's all I, that's all I shoot for. And I think those people, when you start getting to that kind of level of like, Oh, I'm just looking for peace. And people think peace is found in a million dollars. Some people think peace is found in a nice house. Like if you may have all those things and be completely chaos inside and then you're not at peace, man. That's a crappy place to be. I know a few people who um, who do have some money in their life. And when I look at the people around them, it's amazing how many of those people with lots of money, lots of things, they've got the big boats, the cars, the so whatever, you know, people who are, who you wouldn't call rich necessarily, but more like wealthy. Right. Mm-hmm. And they don't have peace. I know a lot of them. They struggle for that. And it's, it's so much simpler to find that I think. And, and it sounds like you, you've, you've really been on that path to find that in your life. Mm-hmm. Consistently, man. It's, it's a, uh, should define what, what true wealth is. I think and I've done it. I've had the NFL and I've made the money and then you come back and you have a broken household and marriage falls apart. There's no peace, man. There's no, there's nothing of use. People think that money buys happiness. I'm a humongous proponent of it. it does not. I think it can alleviate stress. There is a space that is held by stress when there's no money. So I don't, I get that. You need finances to take care of stuff. But then you have the leave of that stress. And then what do you fill it with? It doesn't immediately fill up with, with happiness. People are millionaires, win the lottery, and everything falls apart, right? It really just becomes this amplifier of who you are and what you really have with the soul of yourself. Because now when you have no stress, there's not that filling of time to make the money. Well, now what are you doing with that time? What's being, what's it being filled with? And if it's not a bonded relationship or, um, you know, great friendships or something you love to do, you're met with the realization of this sucks. And then you're out of peace trying to find a way to fill this hole. Victor Frank calls it your existential vacuum. And there's no like meaning to what you're doing. It, you're sucking everything in. And it becomes the drugs and the party and the people and the sex and, and none of it fills the hole, man. And that's a lot of things that, that people, they think that they have, like, I think Jim Carrey talks about, I wish everybody could be rich and famous to, to realize how unfulfilling it is. <laughs> like, it's not all that crazy. It's just once you get to the point of realizing, like, man, I'm good in a cabin where I don't got to pay bills and just watch, watch the river just run or watch my kids play a game like that. That's it, man. No, no financial stress, no sickness, stress. Everybody's happy. Like that's, I do. I'd rather have that over $10 million because the 10 million, what I may have to do to get it and may have to do to keep it may completely unsettle me inside. And there's, that's priceless. I cannot do that. You know, my mom used to, because, well, I'll start with this. My father was a police officer and they don't notoriously make a lot of money. And my mom would always say, well, yeah, money might not buy you happiness, but I'd rather cry in a Mercedes than in a Datsun. And I got to a certain age where I said, I started responding with, well, yeah, but you're still crying, mom. Still crying. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what you're talking about, I experienced just this morning. I mentioned I took the kids fishing Mm -hmm. and watching these kids try to sit and watch a bobber. It's it's like God gave us some some training in, in that moment. I did that a lot as a little boy with my dad. We did a lot of fishing when I was young, and learning yeah. to sit in the quiet and watch a bobber and the bugs are buzzing around and and you know the turtles out there messing with your bait or whatever. And you're just sitting there and learning to sit with yourself in a in the quiet. That's there's a lot of value in learning that skill set. Ton of value. I'm trying to get my youngest son to get that. My daughter can do this. My daughter the other day we had, we just did swimming practice and after some. Uh, what it was, she just grabbed like a cup of water, tea. She makes tea. She's 11. She was like 10 at the time. She goes out in the backyard and sits in a chair and just is sitting there and just watching the birds. And I was amazed. I was like, this is not what typical 10-year-olds do. She's just sitting there. And then my son, he is ADHD. He's diagnosed and everything. And the dude can't sit with himself for three seconds without talking. Like if we don't give him the prompt of like, all right, breathe and just be quiet for 20 seconds. He'll be in a car ride that's five minutes long and have 50 questions. It's the weirdest thing. And so like just that one area, I've had conversations like, look, you need to learn how to go inside your own head and then play a game or watch something or quiz yourself. Question, why does this do this? That's what I do now. I'll be in environments where I I still have ADHD. He gets it from me 100%. But uh, I learned like how to how to go internal. And then just let my brain run inside without bothering other people or how I look at things, or what I question. And so 
definitely like to, to have that skill, I think is a human skill everybody needs. And it sucks that most of society is more like my son. Most kids nowadays with these screens in front of them, their brains are spinning and seeking that dopamine dump from something. They can't just sit and see the world. Yeah. You're describing my five-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's most of them. When I walk in the house at the end of the day, at the end of the work day, he's the one I look to the ceiling to see what part of the ceiling I got to pull him off of. You know, this, yeah. this he is wired for sound. He is just always one hundred and twenty percent, which is it, it's a great part of him. It's part of who he is. Yeah. But we had a big problem with him sleeping at night, and he couldn't mm-hmm. go to sleep. And eventually, I we I found this thing that's called a sensory sleep sock. It's more or less. It's like a, a pillowcase that you put yourself in, and it's it's a real mm. stretchy kind of lycra material. I don't know. It's got a head hole. Super soft. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and it's uh, almost silky, but it, but it's stretchy, and, and it, that yes. has done wonders. The other thing that I found was if I would lay him down upstairs in his bed, and I explained to him just a little bit of basic kind of meditation type stuff, just a breathing exercise really is what it was. Yes. Put yeah. your hands on your on – your, cross your hands and put them on your belly and breathe in until you feel your belly come up and – then breathe out and go real slow. And it's amazing how that alone would put him to sleep in no time at all. But if, if he's not in that headspace, he might be up there for two hours, getting out of bed, running around. I hear his little feet dunk, 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 across yeah. the corn. And he's always surprised when I show up. And he's going, how'd you know I was out of bed, daddy? <laughs> yeah, right. You make a noise, man. My, yeah, my youngest is kind of the same way. They, they, it's, a little, it's sporadic. It's crazy brain. <laughs> and I get it. I tell him, it's like, the, it's, I call it like, when I was a kid, I would sit in the couch. And I would just get up and just like wig out, and uh, and I would just sit back down. And like, what's wrong? I'm like, I don't know. I just had to get the demon out. Like, if like there's like this upwelling of just energy, and I got to just get it out. And so I see him doing those things, and I get it. And so I, what's interesting is we are the most combative relationship in the household. My wife and I have, but the only thing we argue about is my son. Like, how do we parent him? Because I I think it's interesting. I look at my childhood. I'm like, I know what happened because of the way I acted, how I was treated, what went on. I don't want that for him. And so because of that, I'm almost like super over like, stop, don't do that. Control. Like I'm, I'm almost, I'm just more diligent. So the thing with that is like, he's very anti like establishment. Because he's just very just combative with, with <laughs> authority. He doesn't like listening every, hey, Torin, you do this? Why? What should I, what I, what's the reason? Like, stop, just say, okay, dad, just say, okay, dad. We don't need a conversation on this. It's not a back and forth. We go back and forth on all the time. And it's like, man, like, I, I just want him to realize one day I tell him, I privately will tell him this, and I've said in front of my wife, but the thing that he has in his head, this monster that wants to run and spin, like that is a, a thing that most human beings wish they could have. Because when I can get dialed into something and be hyper-focused and perseverate over, like I got to have it, that's a skill that'll get you a lot. His ability to, to communicate and try to figure things out and solve. And like, it's a great skill, but I'm like, if that thing doesn't make it to adulthood successfully, you're going to struggle. If you get there, you'll be more successful than me or your mom ever were in our entire lives. We got to get you past the craziness of getting in trouble in school and the principal's office going to jail. Like we need to make this thing, use it for good kind of thing. And so we're at the stage of trying to get him to just stay dialed in, stay in control, but still, you know, let him know like it's a great thing. It's a good thing to have this as part of you. It's what that makes what makes me successful. I have no problems going in any situation. I got energy. I could drive. I have the charisma to talk and why things he has. But I need him to get to adulthood. I need you to bypass if we can all this other craziness. Just get here, and then you'll be great. You know, I think there's actually a chair in the principal's office at the local school that has my name on it. Because yeah, same. <laughs> I've had enough visits to the the school for my kids that you know, and most of it's not big stuff. You know, some small fighting stuff when because middle school boys. Well, they act like middle school boys mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, they do stupid stuff, but you know, just stupid kid stuff that it's like, man, what's going on? And they can't ever explain it. And it took me a while to, to kind of begin to really understand where their head was going and to, to understand, yeah, that there's a way to aim that in a way that can, can actually end up becoming their superpower. Yeah. Structure is a big piece, but man, I think it's one of the things my wife works in special education. She has a degree in her master's degree in special education and runs a few programs for adults with disabilities and some of the most important things for them is just structure. Like it, it's having the same pattern of when they get up, when they do this, because then when you get you know, thrown in a whack, that's when all the, the, you know, the different behaviors are the pop up. So for him, same thing, like he needs a structure when he doesn't have it, he runs amok. Like he just is out there and doing his craziness. But like when he has it, I get up, I do this, I do this, he excels. And so I'm finding like, I got to get the structure in place and keep it. Cause even though there's a structure in place, He's a kid. He, he bounced up against the walls, man. He tries to push that line. And I'm, I'm the one guy that holds the line. 
So with my wife and I, that's what we argue about. It's like, hey, like hold the line, love. Well, you're just you're so hard and you hold it so hard that I want to be a little easier. And I'm like, yeah, but then when you make it easy on him, then he bumps the line and then I gotta come in and put him back in line. So like if we're just both consistent, he'll be fine. Like I'm not trying to be mean, but if he's not supposed to be on the PlayStation for more than an hour, he needs to be off the PlayStation in an hour, like not an hour and five, not an hour and ten. Because in, in the later part of his life, if the boss says, I need you to be here at, you know, one o'clock and he's there at one ten, you got problems. He doesn't have a job. You know, like this little nuanced things. And so like teaching him how to understand structure, I think for him, which is for me, one of the best things. Why I was on this call, you know, three minutes before we got to get on. Five, usually I like to be on. There's a way that I understand what, what works for me and my structure. That's what allows me to be successful. You know, you mentioned a wife a couple of times. It sounds like you guys have got a pretty decent um, grasp on what it's like to work between uh, a mom and a dad structure and, and keep your uh, keep your parenting skills together that way so that you yeah. can use each other's strengths. Um, I can say because I married a woman, well, a lot of years ago. We've been together for about 20, I think, at this point. Yeah. And it's taken somebody special to learn how to put up with my weirdness. As you can imagine, I have my own bucket of weirdness. Mm, and there we she, all do. Yeah, she came from her, her own bucket of, of weirdness. And, mm-hmm. and we've managed to, to put that together and work together over the years. How have you and your wife worked this? I know from having heard your story in the past that you guys had some struggles in the past, but how, how have you guys yeah. overcome all that and, and become this kind of a, this power team to help guide your sons in the right direction and your daughter? You know, we come from like different angles. My wife actually, she didn't know her dad, but had a very present stepdad and they were, you know, that family was perfect family, you know, had enough money to do the things, play the sports, everybody was good. Then at 16, like right after my craziness and foster kind of came to an end and I started my craziness and like whatever regular life, that's what her craziness happened. Her parents got divorced completely out of the blue through the family for whack. And so I became like the anchor point. So we both kind of grew up uh, together, didn't know each other apart. And so we had a son at 20. You know, we're kids still in college, both full-time students. I'm also a full-time athlete. So we didn't have much of anything, but like, let's just keep ourselves above water. That was the whole sprint. Got to the NFL, got married before we got into the NFL, and then got out of the NFL, had a couple more kids that are twins, and then all hell broke loose, man. <laughs> like, it's, it's interesting, statistically, that if you look at uh, twins, like, there's like a 50-plus percent divorce rate for twins on top of already a 50-plus percent divorce rate for just all marriages. So we're, like, we're not looking very good. And a couple of years, okay, a couple of years into the marriage, six years into the marriage, I want to say, and and all of a sudden, like it just falls apart. Wife has an affair, breaks everything apart, man. Like, yeah, and it, it just everything came shattering down. My life was like over, and and we still had to figure out how to you know navigate the, the co-parenting thing. And back, it was just weird, dude. It was one of those situations where like I felt like I was subjecting my children to the situation I was in without having a present father. They had a guy in the house, wherever my wife was, you know, whoever she was with at the time. And I had a woman at my house just, you know, trying to create that family dynamic, which wasn't really a true family dynamic. But I think the big base of it is we both hadn't grown yet. It wasn't until 31, 31, 32 ish, I want to say, maybe when we started kind of both growing a little bit more because we'd finally been apart long enough to figure out who we were without each other, I guess the best way to explain it. And we came back together about four years ago now, and we've both been able to uh, to grow individually, which allows us to both be happy separately and then come to something both happy, not trying to lean on the other person for happiness or for joy. There's no name calling, true respect for each person. And I think the parenting aspect is something where I draw on mostly what, uh, what will happen. This is the, our biggest dynamic difference. I'm always looking at extrapolating things 10, 15 years down the line when they're adults. I'm like, what am I doing to develop these kids for when they go off in the world so I can sleep at night and be like, they got it. And she's more like, just be easy. It's their childhood. Make it fun. Because that's what she had growing up. It was just like easy. It's all easy. And and her siblings, they're, they're great people, but they're, they've had their struggles. They're not all perfect. And, and I'm like, man, I don't. I look at the parenting style of what created that, and I'm like, yeah, you're an anomaly. Like for her, she's an anomaly to be the only successful person in her whole family. Got to college, has a master's, has a business. There's no one else in her family doing that. I'm in my family. I'm the only one that was any kind of successful. Everybody, like my brother's in the military, where everybody else was kind of just spinning their wheels trying to figure out stuff, catching up late. And so we're both these anomalies, and my dynamic of what I look at is vastly different. I'm like, I didn't have structure. Structure created this different life for me. You did, you'd had an easy life. And so we should probably adjust even her business. She runs now is super simple. Like she's fun, government funded, no marketing, no sales, no advertising, guaranteed money every month. Like it's nuts. And so in our dynamics, the problem is she wants the kids to have fun and she wants the kids to like her. 
And I want the kids to love and respect me so that when they get to the later parts of their life, they have the tools they need to be successful. So they're not coming back to live in my household. And so the way that we work is we respect each other's opinions, even though we don't always agree with them. I don't always agree with what she talks about. How she says, there's not always a thing. I'm like, yeah, I agree with that, but I respect it enough. And I will conform when I feel like it needs to be done, not just for my kids, but also for her and her peace of mind with me as her husband. Because we're a team. And if the team is on the same team, then we fall apart. So there's the same vice versa. There's certain things where I know she does not want to do what I'm asking her to do. But the logic of it doesn't make sense. It feels bad, but she knows it's logically right. And we have those, those back and forth. It's not this easy cut and dry. We do this. She does this. It's an ebb and flow. It's a dance every single day of how do we raise these kids? Because the crazy thing is Stephen Covey talks about you treat everybody the same by treating everybody differently. So we're trying to figure out our parenting styles with kids who are all different, who are all growing, who are all changing. And that's why it's a dance between them and the world and us. And it's just as consistent. How do we ebb and flow? And I think the core of it is we have a great deal of respect and love for each other. We know what we want the kids to have as a future for themselves. At least if it's just control or having choice. So we try to find a way every day to make that come to fruition. It sounds like you guys have really made it work. Um, I interviewed a guy here recently, Brian Post from the Post Institute. And one Mm -hmm. of the things he, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was he said, it was something along the lines of, you you have to learn to see the world from a different lens than you grew up with. And I'm Mm -hmm. curious, do do you think that's been a part of you guys' experiences, learning how to to see the world from each other's lenses? Because you guys obviously came from, from different backgrounds. Yeah, vastly different. And you know, what's funny is I don't even think the way that I was raised is the way that you should be raised. I, I, we had a lot of freedom, more than we needed. There's just too much, you know, there wasn't an academic drive in our house. I was the only person that got any kind of schooling done. Only of six kids actually graduate from the high school without a GED or continuation school. Like there wasn't that kind of foundation. My wife, however, has that foundation and it shows up. She's 4.0 student, summa cum laude at a college. I was like 2.7, but I'm smarter than her. Cause I just didn't care to do homework <laughs> in school. Like I'm maybe, maybe on paper, she's got way better grades, but like real life, she's a book smart brain. She's, she's, she's not street smart and has, doesn't have much random knowledge, but I love her to death. And I think that this, that's interesting. The lens is not trying to see through her lens, but it's both of us trying to see through the future lens what the kids will have. Cause I've realized very clearly the world I grew up in is not my kids world. They're going to grow up in. And I don't even know what they're going to grow into. I know there's certain humans, traits and human skills are always going to need to be there. Can I, can I stand my ground and hold my, my idea and say, this is what I'm going to do and not going to do? Do I have personal integrity, personal pride? Do I show up? Can I communicate with random human beings in public without feeling like I'm scared? Like, are there certain things that you can do as a human? And so for me, it's like, I'm trying to get them to have these weird traits and skills that, that are, they shouldn't be weird. They should, you should normally be able to talk to human beings. But I think the lens that we both look through is like, all right, here's how I see things. Here's how you see things. I will see through your lens, but both of us got to look at what are these kids going to need in 10 years that we don't even realize is, is there. Like, for example, all the kids are on tablets and these, these things. There's a certain like, you know, social language that they're using and communicating with. And if you strip that from your kids completely, like no electronics ever, they're going to grow up and be stunted in their growth in a society they're going to grow into. and They're going to be the oddball. They're going to, someone's going to ask a question, can you do this, can you do this? And because they didn't develop any of that growing up, because, you know, people were preparing their kids for their world. Now the kid has no traits. So like, I have this weird balance of like, I do not want them to be facing down in a computer or a tablet all day, but they also need to some, at times be face down in a computer or a tablet. Because I guess in my head, I'm like, if everybody's doing it, the future might need you to have a little bit of knowledge about that. So like, let's kind of balance it. So seeing that lens together, that's kind of what helps us kind of adjust our parenting styles as we go. Well, it sounds like uh, your wife had a decent dynamic in her house, even if it was a stepdad, not a biological dad, to to see that dynamic between those parents Mm -hmm. and your adoptive parents. Did you have, did they have a good dynamic for you to learn to model? Uh, not really, man. My mom's my first husband was a guy named Ira, drunk, used to beat her, beat my mom. The last vivid memory I have of him in our house is him like punch her in the face in the kitchen before she kicked him out and divorced him. So that wasn't a good dynamic. <laughs> and then my, my dad now, like, yeah, he's good, but he's, he's always just been a worker bee. Like there hasn't always been, and my mom got diagnosed with MS. So she was sick, um, you know, for 17 years before she passed. So pretty much from around the time I was adopted 14, 15 until she passed away. Like my dad just kind of always just took care of her. And so the dynamic there was a really interesting one because 
like it was most of the arguments and tension was because, you know, her life was robbed from her and there was a sickness there. And so she wasn't always mentally there. Um, she, you know, had paranoid delusions on certain aspects, but then like, you know, he would be present and then he would be drained because he'd work all day and then she'd spend money and then he'd have to go work some more and he wasn't able to have time. It's just like he just worked himself to the bone. So like it sucked because both of those, those two hearts, man, they didn't get to fully live life. So the dynamic I got to see there was like, my dad showed love through work, but it wasn't this uh, affectionate, transparent, hold you, kiss you kind of love, if that makes sense. And so I think the way that I look at a lot of things is I, I gauge what I have in my life and what I do based off how I, I feel and what I've seen that I would love to have in my life. So you see the marriages that are like hugging, and kiss and touch and like that kind of thing and positive words. And that's what I think is, is better for society. People know what, what's good and what's, what's bad. Like, I know it's bad to like yell at my wife and call her names, right? So I just don't do that. What happens is sometimes our emotions get the most of us in these heated moments and we do those things. And the reality is, is we'll make an excuse to protect that ego so we can continue to do it and not feel bad. But the reality is like, no, yeah, that's, that's bad. Like, stop doing that because your kids are going to think it's okay. So a lot of the things I do now, in the beginning was difficult because it's emotional in the moment. Like, I don't want to say I'm sorry. I don't want to give you a hug and make it, I got you know, but then you realize like, that's what we got to do. So after a while you start doing, you bite your tongue, you, you eat your pride. And then eventually it's like, Oh, it's not that bad. I'm gonna lose my pride over somebody and bite my tongue. It's going to be for her. And then my kids are going to have a, a model relationship of what it should be for their you know marriage later on. Like, like my daughter, I can't tell her who to choose, but I hope she'll choose someone that she'd want to bring home to dad, but knowing how dad treats mom and how dad treats her and that kind of thing. So I just, I've conformed the emotions to do the things in a moment that the relationship needs, whether it's intimate relationship with my wife or with my kids or whatever it may be. It sounds like you've taken a lot of needs in your childhood and learned how to, to build a life where you stood on those needs and decided to fulfill that for your children. 100%. I've told my wife, recently I told her, I said, my kids, I'm very close to my kids. Uh, I like, I love them. We play games, we wrestle, play, right? But I am so vastly opposite of the, of the experience they're having. Like I know nothing of the life experience. I don't know what it's like to have dad in the house, dad wake me up, dad taking places, dad cuddle on the couch. I do not know. I couldn't tell you one moment that's happened. It hasn't. I didn't know my dad, right? And so the idea is like I'm close to him in physical proximity, but incredibly opposite in terms of experience of childhood. What do you think led you into wanting to become something greater, not complaining about what you grew up with? Uh, I guess at a more, we'll call it logical statement is I, I decided to let go of that identity. Cause I think what ends up happening for a lot of us is there's a whole investment bias of humans. We invest time and energy to something. Therefore we need to have a return or it'll be wasted. So the time we spend in something, I'll protect that time. So I don't feel like I have to accept that I lost some time or wasted energy. It was wrong. And so for me, I got to a point where I, I just, I was tired of being this guy, man. I was tired of having that life and feeling that feeling. And so I realized like I got to let go of whatever that guy is. And so in doing so, like I, I reshaped and rebuilt a new identity and that's just as hard to let go of the previous one. Cause I mean, you lose connections, you lose, you know, um, a sense of self and ownership in certain aspects. And so I think for me, like letting go of that was, just, it's very difficult. Sometimes all you have is that evil. And they say the evil you know is better than the evil you don't. And so sometimes people will protect that because it's all they got. And to give up all of that, it's like, well, I don't know who I am without this thing, even though it could be bad. Like, I don't know who I am without this thing. So if you give it up, it's like, oh, well, well, I don't know. Who am I? And people don't realize, like, yeah, it's just as anchored as you are in that bad part of your identity or whoever you are. Like, there's, you could be re anchored in some amazing piece if you build it. So for me, I just decided to build it. It was a very, very difficult thing because you do go against the grain. You do do things society doesn't expect, like get back with your ex-wife who had an affair like forgive her and, and truly be able to move in a different direction, right? That's a different part of that conversation. Some people legitimately just don't understand. That's okay because they don't live in my household. And you know, 60 years from now, I'm going to sit in a rocking chair and be cool with the woman I, I love and it's mother of my kids. And there's a lot of dynamics there that like I had to get rid of the old Anthony identity who is ingrained typically, like we talked about before, in the world's scale of what's supposed to be done. And so when you start going against the grain, it's difficult, but then at the same time, you find a groove and you flow smooth into it. And that's where I feel like I'm at now. Like I'm in a really good groove. Like I've earned it. It's been really, really hard, but it's crazy. The groove came from breaking away from the common mold most people mold themselves into in life. Well, it sounds to me like you're saying that the place you're at right now is maybe even a better place in your own world than while you were busy playing for the NFL. Oh, hell yes. My 10, 10 times over it is. I would... <laughs> I would like, if I knew this was going to be my life, I would end the game quicker. <laughs> if I like, stopped the game quicker, I mean, to be honest, 
the, the football world, everybody thinks it's flashy. It's amazing. And don't be wrong. Like I fully appreciate and love my years spent playing football. It, it developed the intangibles that make me, me, I think without football, I'm not this guy. I just learned how to apply the intangibles to a, you know, a tangible world outside of football, which most people unfortunately can't do. But yeah, those years, man, it's you're running and gunning, it's fast paced away from the family. You're, you know, you're just, you're distant from the world. You're completely separated. And I'm also unable to impact the world in the way that I'm capable of doing now. Cause most people, they don't hear the personal story. It's how many touchdowns tackles, what just, you know, what team you playing on, how much money you got, what car you driving. Whereas now the predominant aspect of what you see when you follow me is like, my family and the career that I have and, and the work I do and what I'm giving back to the world. And that's a vastly different impactful type of work than what I would have been doing as a working as a football player. You know, that's one of the things when I did a quick Google search for your name, I noticed that there was a handful of pictures of you with a uniform and a helmet on, mm-hmm. but there were way more pictures of you trying to reach out and, and help other people. And that's yeah. I think kind of indicative of what your life has become. It's way more work helping people than it is, just playing a game yeah i got like one or two pictures of football that i ever share or even use or in the world everything else is all me with my family my kids and me on a stage and it's just there's just there's more of me that's there and i think the thing is i'm a man of faith and i believe that uh that I, all those things took place i was put in a certain pedestal so that people would listen to me right I think there's always been a grand plan for me because a lot of crazy navigators that a lot of people never get past multiple moments where people just never get past them in life like we've talked about this whole entire time somehow I've been able to get past them without a true intentional plan of it all. But then at the same time, I got to a place where I had these, these areas I've achieved. I've, you know, I've been on TV and I've been in the NFL and I've made good money and I have this family that's a, you know, an interracial family. And I, I have this, this sense of, of self. It's just a different thing I've navigated to. And I believe all of that was, was done in a weird, intentional, uh, biblical way, we'll call it, to be in a place I am now to do this. Like, I feel like this is literally what I was, you know, putting the plan to do crazy experiences, get through them, try and get back in the back end and talk about it. Cause not many six foot one, 240 pound former NFL linebacker guys are talking about, yeah, my wife cheated on me. I took her back or here's what self love is, or, you know, my, my foster experience or like the people just don't talk about it. So I figure if nobody talks about it, it doesn't mean anybody's not going through it. Cause a lot of people are, but what if there's some of that, that, that people can hear, talk about it. And then actually have respect for it because because of my stature, like men will listen to me. Alpha male played you know, NFL, played this a, a big game. Like I have some muscles and I take care of myself. It's like, okay, we can listen to this guy. But then also with women, I'm not intimidating because they see the, the family I have and how much I genuinely love my wife. So there's not this, like they'll message me without this fear of me trying to hit on them. So I have this space to enter people's lives in a unique dynamic. And I'm a black male that, that you know, in, in society, it's kind of strewn all crazy. I'm also not like, you know, pro white and Republican and not pro Democrat. I'm like a weird in between guy, I guess I'll call it. So I have this weird sense of self and perspectives that somehow aid a lot of people. I'm a gap. I, I bridge a lot of gaps for a lot of people's worlds and it finds, it finds itself to be in a place that helps them. And that's what I think I'm here for. I don't know how it happened. It wasn't a grand plan that I, I planned just kind of led me here. But yeah, man, I've lived a vastly different life than what most people would assume it to be. You know, you mentioned the interracial family thing. I mean, our family is about as interracial as you can get. I think um, we have about half of the kids in the house right now are are mixed. Um, half of them are, are white. And the ones who are mixed, we have, you know, different. Yeah, everybody thinks, you know, they're you're either black, you're white, you're mixed. You know, but but we have like a rainbow skin tones, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things. I mean, right down to me, if if you see me in public, I always laugh and, and jokingly say I'm ambiguously brown because <laughs> I don't look at I don't look like my mom. I don't look like yeah. my dad. Um, yeah. For whatever reason, me and my two of my younger siblings all yeah. look very similar in skin tone. It's just mm-hmm. it's something that came out. I even did the genetic test to fi- figure out where does this come from. And it says I'm a European mutt. Basically, it gave me no information at all. Mm-hmm. But the interracial piece is something that we've been really learning to navigate with a lot of kids. You know, my our older um, oldest adopted. Well, without getting too confusing on who's who, but our 14 year old son, he you know he's interracial. His biological dad was black. His mom was white. And he's to that point where he he's growing his hair out. He wants to get it braided. As a matter of fact, I think they're closed today and tomorrow. And he's not happy about that because he <laughs> wants to get it done. <laughs> and we, good, we, yeah. yeah, we've braided it before. You know, well, he, we've had it braided. Not these hands don't do those braids. 
I, I can do a girl's braid kind of, but I'm not that dexter, dexterous to be able to sit and do that. But, you know, it's one of the things that we kind of came to the, to the this world with without any real knowledge of how that works. And the interracial right. adoption can go so wrong in so many places. Um, were, were your your adoptive parents, were they white or was that, was that interracial white. as well? Okay. Yeah, all white. Yeah, my older brother was white and Mexican because that's my wife. My mom, you know, married or not. She married him. No, she just had a kid with him when they were 14. But, uh, but yeah, that was it, man. It's just, just me, the lone, lonely black guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was that like though for you growing up and, and being pushed? Because I mean, we, we've, we've learned that, that like hair stuff is different. I mean, hey, there's yeah, so many yeah. pieces of it that you have to learn. Skin care is different. I mean, and you can learn that. I don't care what, what yeah. race you are. I mean, just see, buy some lotion and then you, just, you, you get a brush. I mean, you don't have to, I think there's this weird, that seems to be the conversation people have. You don't even know how to do that kid's hair. Like, and <laughs> it's this weird, <laughs> my, yeah, it's really weird. I get the hair thing. Like I, at one point grew a fro and I picked it out and I had, you know, I got braids and everything. But I mean, it's not like we had to do a bunch of research. It's like you just ask somebody, hey, what do we put in this kid's hair? Put some, put some I don't know, cocoa butter in. All right, we're good. And then like, <laughs> I just, I didn't need a bunch of, sk- like, like uh, you know, suntan loaves. That's really it. I just don't have, I don't do a lot of like sunscreen. I, I do obviously now at this age, but like growing up, I didn't need much. I'm just the, the little kid who gets really dark and then I'm, I'm protected. <laughs> I guess. I don't know, but it wasn't, oh, uh, yeah, there wasn't was much race issues growing up. If anything, we were, we were presently aware of it. You know, there's eight of us who go to a restaurant, like table for seven, like now little black kids with us too. So you have these dynamics, but it wasn't anything that stood out as being hard or difficult or crazy. If anything, I had it more at school with a lot of like my classmates who would say things, but at home, man, it was just, it was as normal as you can imagine. Yeah. I mean, with everything that we have with our different kids and things like that, it's it's really crazy because like one kid's our uh, six-year-old, he's like, yeah, I'm brown. I'm brown, mom. And then I've got another one who says, "Mm, I'm brown, so I can't get pimples. And I'm like, um, it doesn't work that way. (laughs) It works. You know, but yeah, Yeah. one of our kids is different and, you know, we've had to learn it. And hair care is one thing, especially in the foster world, it's a big thing for people. You know, they yeah. freak out about it. What do I do? What products do I use? Where do I go? You know, yeah. like for us, we're kind of in a rural area. So to get our kids hair done, we have to travel a little bit, you mm-hmm. know, but I it's not it. impossible, but you do what you got to do for your kids. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Fortunately for us, our, um, you know, our area that we're in has actually got quite a, quite a diverse group of people who live here, you know, ethnically diverse around here. So, you know, my mm-hmm. son went over to a friend's house and came back with his hair braided, you know, and I'm like, Hey, cool. You know, the, um, What's her name over there? Birdie. Birdie, yeah. Sorry, I was losing my mind. Sure going from there, but yeah, Miss Birdie. Miss Birdie took care of his hair for him and, and braided it up because that's what he asked her to do. So you know, it's great that they have some connection with people who have that, you know, different experiences ethnically and racially and culturally to 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 have that mm-hmm. piece of it in their life still. But that's one of the things that a lot of kids talk about missing. And did you did you have that opportunity when you were a kid, or were you like you said just the lone kid who was who was different in the area just just the lone kid who was different man I, I grew up in a really non-diverse area i got called like a nigger at school a lot like these little two kid, little white kid twins i just it was always i was in fights i was a crazy little kid i was actually a flight risk in sixth grade i was not allowed to go to, to the sixth grade camp because of the flight risk i wasn't in trouble at the time but like the odds of me getting in trouble were like probably 100 to 1 like you know i'm gonna get in trouble I'm going to get in trouble. Like it's going it's, to, so they're like, we can't have this kid in the woods. So I didn't get to go, <laughs> but like, I was always in fights. I was a kleptomaniac. I was just, I was always a bothersome kid. And I, I think a lot of it was like the dysfunction between my foster home and my biological mom. And then at school, just acting out for attention. Cause I was also one of, you know, a bunch of kids at home and just completely unsettled and unstable. There's, there's no base. Like there was this one, I think it was third grade, second grade, Mrs. Zanasi's class. And I ran to her at Starbucks at some point in time, years later, like might've been like four years ago. So I was talking like, I hadn't seen her in like 30 years or something crazy. <laughs> and, uh, and she remembered me. She's like, yeah, I remember you. And there was a situation where I had this, this thing with the vice principal that if I was to get through a day and get four stars, which means just don't get in trouble for the day. If I got four stars, I get a full size payday candy bar and I can get one every single day of the school year if I wanted to. And we're poor. Like I don't get candy bars. I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. all through the school year, I didn't get it once. Didn't get it one time. I didn't, not one time that I get that candy bar, man. And like, I tried, I tried so hard, but the day I'm throwing erasers at people, I'm, I'm messing with it. It just always was that way. And so, yeah, man, I didn't have that, that sense of stability. And I had the issues at, at school. I just didn't have anybody that looked like me. I think I was one of 
two black kids in the entire school in sixth grade before that, just me. Super weird, but that, that I didn't have the outlets. I didn't have, I mean, even my, you know, my, I call it my stepdad, um, who was like my, my biological mom's guy. She had other kids, but he was, you know, Indonesian. So there was nobody. I was just me, you know, kind of riding through life by myself for a while. When I was young, we lived for a couple of years in the backwoods of Tennessee. It's, uh, yeah, we were way out in the woods and, and I had some of that, that same racial tension just because I looked different. I was darker and I would get some of those questions and, and um, you know, it, it was yeah. always kind of an issue as, as I was a younger kid. And even as I grew up, I kind of stopped noticing it, I think. But, you know, the fact is that you look different. And that was a big deal for a lot of kids because we were in a rural area. Yeah. We were away from the um, away from, you know, any kind of diversity. Mm-hmm. And so it can be a struggle for kids. But for some kids, it, you know, they, they use that to, to become to, to build their identity, I guess, is the right way to put it. Yeah, a lot of kids will use that to build their identity. Do you think that that, yeah. that was part of how you built your identity as well? Or did it matter to you? I think for sure I did. I mean, because you want to fit in. That's the one thing we do. You conform to your society. So even though I was a crazy active kid, I still conformed. And you become like what I call the token black guy. There's always the one token black guy. You make the white jokes. You just you, you'll go back and forth. And and that's kind of where I sat. My best friends in the world to this day, fourth grade, man. So I think second grade for my buddy Jay. Like we just known each other for years. And so there's been a lot of interesting parts of that relationship. You know, like at the, the time we were great. Then when I went to high school, went to separate high schools and I kind of first got introduced to people that looked like me. And so we kind of went our separate ways a little bit, we'll call it. Cause I was like with the black guys now and I was a little, you know, a little different. I'm learning about my culture. And I'm like, that's not me. Like I'm the athlete. So I became the athlete and then down with the college and then, you know, kind of got back in closer touch. And when I got back from college, the NFL got really close. We're really close now. Like he's actually to the extent to where like when I've contemplated moving <laughs> my entire family, I'm like, yeah, but then I won't be close to Jay. You know, <laughs> Like it's that, is that close? He's got his own wife and kids and everything. So it's, but yeah, man, I think there's that you definitely conform to where you're at so that you can actually live in that environment without a lot of just, you know, I don't know, abrasiveness and, and a lot of confrontation. And we all will do that. So I did do that as a kid. I have at this point in my life, I, I have no problem being completely who I am though. And it's not to say like, I'm going to be me just in spite, just to be me. It's like, I know who I am and I hold my ground and I hold my line and I hold my integrity. But the one thing I do is because I fit in in my home. And I think that's one of the things is I've, I've, I've really got, to me, like a phenomenal family. I have a, a powerfully bonded and connected kids that love each other as brother and sister, but still argue because they're kids. My wife and I are dialed in. We can all, I, we can, this quarantine dude has been amazing. We haven't had arguments. We haven't had issues. We haven't had crazies, anything more than you'd have at any other time. But like, you'd think that much time again with people, like if they're not good, everything will exacerbate but we're good. We play games. We hang out. We do, we do. And it's like, man, that's the, the biggest pieces. I think having that anchored place, because even when I was growing up, I was still anchored at home. I was still loved at home. My mom, foster mom like still loved me at home. So even with all that craziness going on at school, I never felt completely out of whack. We had our dysfunction because we're a family. But like, yeah, having that base allows you to really kind of be who you are. But I think there was also, again, growing up, there's conformity because society in and of itself is a monster you're trying to figure out until you figure it out usually much later in life you know you've mentioned it a couple times but how the uh the way that your family had a place to come back to seemed to be the thing that built the base regardless of how crazy the world around you was and even if you were part of that craziness in the world that that was kind of Mm -hmm. i guess the the base that you built from instead of focusing on the craziness around you yeah you have to i mean that's if you don't have stability in some capacity somewhere, then you can't go out. It's like it's like not having an anchor and trying to stay in, in docked up as a boat. I mean, that's why I think a lot of people unfortunately aren't grasping. Like they they think that just having a friend or two is an anchored base, and it's not because those friends, if they're unanchored, both ships are gonna end up out in the ocean in the middle of the storm, right? So for me, like the home anchor base is is what keeps me in in port. And if for some reason I may drift off a little bit, like the chain holds me back, and I'm like, ah, that's my anchor. Let's go back to that. So whether it's decisions or, you know, I just say, you know, the expectation of the five people you spend the most you know time around. It's not, it's true. I believe expectations, not just the average of them, but it's like, what are the expectations of that group? And so if the group that I spend the most time around is my family, which it is, the expectations of the trucks are certain things. There's integrity, there's honesty. We don't lie. We work hard. We don't cut corners. We're not lazy. We show up, we give, we serve. We're, we're people of faith. There's these anchor points. 
And so I built a lot of them that weren't in place when I was growing up. But even the ones we had in place when we were growing up, we weren't like a reckless, crazy household. We were just kind of dysfunctional, right? So we still had some back then. I just, you know, you, you stick to what they are. We don't steal. We don't, you know, cause harm. We, we do work hard. My parents did work hard. Like there's certain things that you learn, like when there's a stable base, it anchors you back in, in the port. So you don't end up out in the ocean in craziness. Yeah, it's great to have that that anchor to come back to that place that that is home. They're kids, yeah. They want to they want to be out in the ocean because they think it's great. But you've been in the ocean, you're like I'm telling you, son, it's not that great. <laughs> <laughs> like it's you know you're gonna get you get top sided and turn over. Just give just wait a little bit. Just keep growing the size of the boat, and then I'll let you out there. But that's kids, man. My 11 year old thinks he knows everything. He's trying to teach me stuff that I know he doesn't know about, and, and I know. It. So it's like you want them to have that, but it's like you don't just yet. So pump the brakes dude but that's that's just humans man yeah my uh i think he was about 13 the first time he tried to explain to me how he was a real man mm. and i'm like uh you that's know great. I get it. <laughs> that's great that's cute <laughs> cute that's what i could, you know as long as you have to tell people that you're a real man that's usually because they can't see it and they don't yeah. see it for a reason yeah, who are you kind of convinced at that point you know and yeah. I think for him, it was a lot of him trying to convince himself because he has been through through a lot of struggles with that. You know, my my yeah. kids have some real traumatic stories. Each and every one of them actually have, about it. have some pretty heavy trauma in their history. Mm-hmm. And, and so now I can only imagine with, with your experience, especially having had five foster homes that were not what you would describe as awesome places to live, mm-hmm. you know, on top of having left your, your first home there's probably a lot of trauma in there. Have you done any work with that trauma or is that something that you did on your own? How, how have you learned to, to step yeah. through those trauma? I, you know, I, it's interesting. I get asked that question a lot. I didn't do therapy or anything and I'm not against it. I think that you definitely need to work through it. I, I, I think at one point I had this, uh, it's like complete break uh, of self. And I was like, I got to figure out. Cause at one point in time, I wasn't good in relationships, wasn't a present father. I wasn't taking care of my body. My career wasn't doing well. I just think my relationships are just they're out of whack, but friendship, non-intimate friendship. And I realized like, man, I am the common denominator between all of these things being crazy right now. Like everything, if you go back to what it, they're all really connected, it's me, man. Like I am, I'm the tree with the breeze, all the branches. And so at that point, I kind of had this sense of like, I'll step back and figure out how I navigate these things. And so I think I started doing a lot of the work, just having hard conversations, man, taking a look at myself and realizing like, okay, I built this guy. Somehow this guy got built intentionally or unintentionally. He got built unintentionally for the most part. And I was like, well, if this guy unintentionally got built, what if I intentionally started working on him? What if I did something that would build this guy the way I wanted to? And I think that was kind of the one catalyst. It's like, okay, what does that guy do? Like, what are the things that he thinks and he believes? How does he show up? How does he serve? Where, where does he, you know, ask for forgiveness? Where does he give forgiveness? All these things. And then I think in doing that, I started getting this point of like building this guy little by little. And uh, and I think through that process, I had a lot of hard conversations and I think it healed a lot of stuff. Like I, I would talk to a lot of people, not my real mom. It's the one person I ever actually talked to, but I don't, I don't think I need to. You know, like I don't have this draw because I, I grasp. Uh, I, I guess I, I grasped the fact that she was missing so much. A lot of what she did wasn't to intentionally hurt me. She just didn't have the tools. It's like those kind of things have given me a ton of peace and, and allowed me to kind of navigate some hardships. And I think after it all, I went into this thing called Landmark. And it's interesting because I got to Landmark. Have you ever did a Landmark forum or heard of that before? I have not. Landmark is like a personal development. They call it like, you know, three years of personal development in like three days. And they do shove a lot in there. And it's interesting because I went to this thing at the back end of my, like my journey of crazy, like trying to figure me out, like three years of just navigating stuff. So when I got there, the things they were asking me to do, like I'd already done. The problem was it took me three years to do it. But they have this thing where if you don't have anything to do while you're there, like they poke you. They find one person, they just dig in so that they can show that you're just trying to hold this wall. They're like, you know, find any person you have a bad relationship with and go and have a conversation. It's crazy. I'd already done that. I went and had a conversation with the guy my wife had an affair with and my wife and then, you know, family and like all, I'd done all this crazy calls for the last like year and a half, really tough conversations. So when I get to this room, I'm like, Oh, I already did that. They're like you have nobody else. I'm like, literally I have nobody else right now. I have, I have done this. And, and so like, it's interesting because I, I guess the way I'm even weaving into the conversation now is if anybody's ever heard of landmark or things like that, take a look. Cause they do benefit. But uh, it was almost like a validation that I, I was on the right track. I, I did it my own way. It took a lot longer time than necessary. It was validating. Like I did the work. Like I've, I've healed a lot of those areas. And they do take time, man. It takes 
it's, it's an emotional thing that, that a lot of the time we get emotional. We don't always have a logical piece to it. It doesn't make sense. We're, it's either you're logical or you're emotional. It's hard for the brain to be in both places until my brain made logical sense of the emotion of like why I felt that way and how it kind of came to be and, and where the lingering aspects were that made made me you know take these emotions I had and have them come out in certain ways of anger or you know uh, ways I treat people. When I started figuring out why they were there, where they came from, and honestly understanding other people more. It gave me a better chance to alleviate the negative emotions I had tied to those people, which healed a lot of the crazy pain I had. That's that's pretty much where it came from, man. Just living life and accidentally doing something the long and hard way that uh, that was the right stuff to do. That's so useful because I hear people talk about healing your your past traumas. I hear people talk about things like, you know, you need to work through this. You need to do the work to get there. But nobody has a real clear explanation of what that means. No, it's different for everybody, I think. I think you might be right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we lost a daughter, and, and how do you work through those emotions? How do you work through those experiences? I, mm-hmm. Man, they don't write a, I'd say they don't write a book. I'm certain there's quite a few books written about it, but there's not a book written about my experience, I promise you. Yeah, same here, man. There's no, I mean, unless you write the book, but even then, it's like it, you, need it, you need it now more than, more than to write the book. You know, like I need it to be able to operate from. And that's the thing is, I think a lot of life, everybody's looking for the silver bullet. And there's not a silver bullet. I think what's crazy is we inherently, I think we believe, uh, well, believe we know there's a lot of things we should and shouldn't do. And I think it's a great plan for us, even with hardships like that. But I think what ends up happening is somewhere inside our, our emotions mess the plan. Whether it's not visiting something or bottling it up or not expressing it or not talking about it or not admitting something to ourselves to give ourselves permission to improve in something. I think those things, they become like, whenever we meet those weird, uh, like very hard to, to you know, push past walls, some people just get stuck in them for their life. And I think if you can understand that it's okay to have a weakness, it's okay to have that wall exist, well, now you give yourself permission to get out the tools to climb that wall. But a lot of people, man, they, they just, they get addicted to the struggle, the, the pain of it all. They just, they have a weird sense of comfort in the pain because they know that pain. And so they get stuck there. And I've seen family and friends, siblings get stuck in that place. And it sucks because you can't make them get out of it. They got to be the ones that got to get out of it. So they talk about you can't want something more for somebody than they want for themselves. And like I can want something from all day long, but until they want it, and they're willing to kind of do that extra little bit, they're going to get stuck there. But most people, man, they're, they're comfortable in the place they're at. There's a story about a guy who's sitting on a porch and there's this dog that's just moaning next to him. Someone comes up and says, why is the dog moaning? And he goes, he's sitting on a nail. He says, why doesn't he get off? He says, does it hurt bad enough? And I think for a lot of us, it's kind of how it is. Like, it just doesn't hurt bad enough to get off the nail. Isn't that the story of parenting in general, though? We, <laughs> we have these things we want for our kids, but yeah. they don't always want it. They don't always want it. Yeah, you can't. Uh, I found that I'm, the, I'm a, like a professional personal development coach. Like, I'm, I work with massive companies, you know, and I'm, I'm sought after, yet I can't get my own kids to do stuff or, or see things certain ways. I'm like, is something wrong here? And it's just too close. I think sometimes I think for me, I realized that, that it's not up to me to have to solve their problems or be that for them, but I can introduce them to people that have inspired me and that I think could change them. And if I can introduce them, they may hear it differently. Sometimes people are legitimately just too close to learn from you. And so, yeah, that, that nail thing, I'm like, oh, so sometimes I'm able to get them off of this, to introduce them to work that I think could actually give them the, the sea that somebody else could water. I know that you mentioned you were, uh, you're a religious guy and I, maybe you can remember where this comes from. I can't remember it and I won't get book chapter and verse or even the quote, right. But I believe the line I remember is um, something to the effect of a prophet will find no honor in his own home. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I found that to be so true. It was, a, I believe it was a, a messianic prophecy out of the old Testament. If I remember all my stuff, right. From all those years of, of, uh, going to church. Yeah. I can't fully place it. it, it there's truth in that. And my, my own kids oftentimes won't hear what I have to say. And I think it's because we're so close. I had one son who was going through some tough stuff and, and I sent him to I have a good friend of mine. He grew up with this dude since we were little. And I sent my son down to stay for a week or two with him. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. He came home and he said, dad, you know, uncle Steve really ha- had a lot to say. I learned a lot from him. And we're talking on the ride home because yeah. he's in Colorado. We're in Missouri. So I met him out there on, the, you know, somewhere past the halfway point to pick him up. And he says, mm-hmm. you know, the thing I learned, though, was that a lot of the stuff that you said in the past, he said he said a lot of the same things. But, Dad, he knows how to say it in a way that, that I could hear it. Yeah. I laughed on the inside. of like, yeah, no, he said the exact same thing I did. I'm sure of it. Yeah. But 
it's you yeah. could hear it because it was coming from someone else different source there's coaching studies that uh, that were done i used to do a lot of youth training before i sold my gym in 2018 that's a big world i was in and the studies showed that there was actually you know they would have the same coaching point said by a coach and then by a parent and what the kid heard when a, when a parent would you know tell them whatever they had to tell them they heard my parent doesn't love me there's something wrong that's why they're telling me this a coach say the exact same thing exact same tone this is even my parent, but they're giving me time. They must really care about me. Awesome. I'm going to listen to different dynamics. So like sometimes coaching your kid is the worst thing you can do because it's a different relationship there. You can't be both. So like, yeah, ex exposing them to people with similar values that can say things that are probably the exact same, but just hearing from a different source gives their mental or their psychology a different reason as to why it's being said. And it latches on better. How do you use that with your own kids? I have my buddies. Uh, I am very keen on and the conversations we have about our kids. And then when my friends are over, they'll talk to them and they'll say something. Or, you know, I just, I think my oldest is 15 and a half. He's 16. I'll tell, I'll talk to him like I would talk to you. Like, look, here's the thing. I'm your dad, which means you're probably not going to listen to what I'm saying. I'm just telling you, just put this in the back burner. It, you're going to find at some point in time it might be true. And if that one thing, if one is it's true, contemplate the fact that maybe the rest of the stuff I'm telling you is true, right? And I'm only telling these things because I want you to do well. I don't need to live vicariously through you. I'm not the dad who's trying to see my kid play in the NFL because I never did. Like, dude, I accomplished a lot. I'm still accomplishing things. I have no need to do this for me. Like, I, I just want you to have an amazing life because I didn't have one. I wasn't, I wasn't given these gifts. And, and to be honest, like, and I tell him, I said, if you get to the back end of your life and you're not happy or you're missing out on opportunities or you didn't accomplish your goals, me because of you and that regret's going to be something that's really really heavy because we'll provide for you everything get we've moved our family to be closer as private school we pay for coaches we pay for different stuff it's like dude we have the funds to be able to provide any resource you want there's little kids out there like me who didn't have any of those and still succeeded so just keep in mind like i am only doing what i'm doing like legitimately so you can be amazing all of you kids but you got to anchor down to the things i'm saying and realize they're not i'm not saying them so you have a bad day I'm not saying to, to mess your, your life up. I'm saying I'm just that your life is amazing later on. I'm glad that you found a way to get through to your kids. They still can't hear that from me, but <laughs> we're working on that. We're getting there. He's, he's a smart kid. I think that's why he's, he's got a good brain. He's got a good heart. I love him. He's just a phenomenal human being, man. My son is, he's way farther ahead of where I was at at his same age mentally. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, no, I have a 14 year old who he's about to turn 15. I think next year he turns 35. Just to ask him, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. he, he's, you know, he's one of these kids who who has big plans on playing in the NFL. And to mm -hmm. be fair, like this kid's got some, some skill sets that it's going to serve him well. He, he could, mm -hmm. I, I don't think he'll have to pay for college for sure. He's, he's a, cool. yeah, I think he's going to, to be, if he, if he keeps his head straight and keeps his grades in the right place and then he moves forward. But some of the conversations that we've had over the last few years, you know, discuss the fact that the NFL actually stands for not for long. You know, it takes one injury is all it takes. And you don't get to control those injuries on the field. And uh, so now mm -hmm. he, he's got it in his head that he, he wants to do that. And he wants to build, you know, figure out how to build another career alongside, which, which I'm, I'm so happy you heard that part Good. because, yeah. you know, he, he's getting there. But, but I look at him and I watch this kid and he is, he is so amazing on so many levels. But he's still struggling mm -hmm. through a lot of that trauma, and and we, we work through that, and it's it's such a challenge for him sometimes that yeah. that I, I know that that's a hard part, but it's amazing to see a guy like you who've come out of that, who've walked through those things, who can inspire other people to go, hey, you know, Anthony did not have like these idyllic childhood that that had nothing but sunshine and roses and rainbows, mm -hmm. and he walked through a lot of hard stuff and he's changed a lot of things in his life. And, and he's currently on the path to change the entire trajectory of his legacy, his whole family mm -hmm. for generations to come will be absolutely molded by the man you choose to become. Yeah. I agree hundred percent. And that's inspirational. Yeah. So that's why I do what I do, man. That's what I said. A helmet. You don't know this. If I'm in a helmet. This is just a cool story here in passing, but because of what I do now, I'm blessed to be able to have this conversation more broadly. Yeah. I, and I'm glad you took the time to, to come out here and talk with us today because, man, I think that the biggest part of your story that, that really has affected me so much is that, yes, you came from hard places. And yeah, you went to amazing places that everybody would love to be. You know, I want to be that guy playing in the NFL. You know, like you mentioned, the money and the cars and all the things that we're supposed to be chasing. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I don't know if you're driving a Lamborghini today or not, but. Not in the Lambo, man. I'm good. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I got a truck. I like my truck. <laughs> well, once you have kids, I don't think you're allowed to have a Lambo anymore. I think they take the keys away. I don't depends what age you have kids. I think, I think well, my kids will most definitely not drive mine. I mean, I, I could buy one if I wanted to, but I actually contemplated at one point. I'm like, what the hell am I going to do with it? Like, just, I'm not going to drive it. It's not gonna, I, I'd much rather be in my truck where I can fit the entire family and we can all go hang out. I got a nice truck, though, but still. But hey, not, not to knock the guy with the Lambo, man. If that's what you want, hey, by all means, give you peace. Go get it. Hey, I'm going to tell you right now, sitting in my garage, there's no Lambo, but I do have a Harley out there and I can't take the whole family anywhere on that. But every now and then it is nice to just go take a nice little ride. And that's kind of my, my meditative space, if you will. You know, I social distance to Harley Davidson. There you go. I used to have uh, my own, I I was more of a street bike guy. I I since stopped, but uh, I didn't do anything crazy. I was like, I like that because it was just like you said, it was just me in the road, hard times, arguments and craziness. I could get on that bike and ride and legitimately like, it's just, you can't, you can't not think of the road. So you can't be thinking about the craziness. It just clears your head. You're just looking at the road ahead of you and you're solo. Like, yeah, I definitely know what that feeling is. Yeah. The, you know, they talk about the peace of being out there by yourself, but I think you're hundred percent right. I have to be conscious of everything in front of me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At all times. Because in a blink of an eye, a deer comes out of the, out of the woods and runs across. I mean, the interstate highway, we have deer run across that occasionally. They don't make use it, make it across. Yeah but I don't want to catch one of them when I'm on two wheels for sure. So you have to be in that moment constantly. And I think that's the, why it's such a meditative space for me. Yeah. No bro hugs from the bucks. I'll get you. <laughs> yeah. Cause that's usually a story that's told on the evening news. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. No, I get that's why I got rid of my bike, man. I guess I just I think for me is this, I like doing it, but you never know what crazy drivers or crazy animals are out there. So I was like, I'm going to be safe from now on. I hear you. I haven't gotten to that place yet. I'm still enjoying mine, but it's all good. You know, we'll see what time brings. Yeah, I guess. So. I, I do appreciate you coming on here today and talking because, man, you, the inspiration of your story is bound to to make somebody look and realize that regardless of what their history is, their future hasn't been written. Yeah, I agree. And a guy like you has written an amazing present and future and gone to that world of like the whole NFL and car thing and fancy and money and all that and then step beyond that mm-hmm. to the place where you're you are enough that you are happy, you're content, you're a father, and you're in the place you want to be and helping others get there as well. Yeah. Is there a way for people, I know you mentioned that you do your own coaching stuff online. Yeah. Is there a way for people to get a hold of you that, that they can find you? I mean, I'm certain you're on social media. Yeah, you're Anthony Trucks on uh, Instagram or Facebook, anywhere. I'm the only Anthony Trucks besides my son that I know of. And uh, if not, go to anthonytrucks.com. That's easy enough, man. That's right. It, your son is a junior? He's a, not a junior, different middle name. So I'm Anthony Hart Trucks. My adoptive family's last name is Hart, so I made it my middle name. Uh, and then my son's middle name is Anthony Mack Trucks. The mother's son is Torian Diesel Trucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had some fun with that, it. That's awesome. That's great. I love it, man. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, people want to find you online. I want to make sure that they get out there um, and, and they can find you and talk to you and uh, and check out your stuff on your, on your social media because the more good things in our feed the better we are because and facebook is a scary place these days isn't it it's a minefield man i just i take it with a grain of salt <laughs> yeah yeah and guys like you making it a better place so we appreciate that yeah. well i appreciate your time today and hopefully we will talk to you soon sounds good